Well, I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Every year at this time, um, inexplicably, my heart um, and my mind turns to the subject of freedom. Freedom. Well, maybe it's because of Independence Day or something. You know, we get, we, we're, it's a we're celebration of freedom. And we always say, well, it's a free country, and it really is. It's a great country. And uh, your freedom is a very important subject, okay? And it just occurred to me one day, you know, to, to look at it closely because I realized that there's a true and a false freedom in our society is racked by the conflict between these two principles. The true and the false freedom. Now, Je Jesus talks about true freedom in John 8, and I'm almost sure you'll know what this verse is. John 8, we'll start in verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Man, what a... What a powerful concept, right? Truth will make us free. Now, this also illustrates, too, as the Bible always does, the depth of human psychology, the true psychology, okay, the capacity for self-deception people have. Because actually, when Jesus told them that, they, they got offended and they said, look, we have never been in bondage to anybody. We are Abraham's seed. We've never been in bondage to anyone. And that's so loaded with self-deception. I mean, currently they were under bondage to the Romans, before that to the Greeks, before that to the to Seleucids, before that. <laughs> I mean, you go all the way back to Egypt. That's one big, long story of bondage. But people are so capable, all of us, of deluding themselves of some adherence to a fantasy about themselves. That's not true. And then, and to the extent that you hold on to that, then you're not free. The people are not free to the extent that they believe lies. Like if the truth sets you free, then you could infer from the opposite of that, lies actually bind people. That there's no freedom without truth. But then Jesus said, look, uh, in, in verse 35, the servant remains not in the house forever, the son remains forever. If the son therefore will make you free, you will be free indeed. So there you, there you have it, the free indeed, true freedom, right? You could be free indeed. What? Turn up the sound? Okay. You could be free indeed. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Second Peter. I won't have you turn there, but I'll quote it. Peter, warning about false prophets and false teachers, said that one of the marks of the false prophet or teacher is they promise people liberty, but they themselves are the slaves of corruption. So you've got people in total bondage preaching freedom, and people listen to this freedom, and they come into bondage themselves, promising you liberty, Peter said. They themselves are the slaves of corruption. Now that's the false freedom. There's true and false freedom. That's always been the story running right down through the philosophical undergirdings of our country. True and false freedom. And, you know, humanism has a, a, a misconception I think it was Rousseau who said, man is born free, but everywhere he is, he is found in chains. And what he's saying is, you know, your natural state is freedom, but once you get into society, these institutions in society, they put you in bondage. And that sounds right and reasonable to a lot of people, but that doesn't factor in what the Bible, see, I gotta make a contrast. The Bible does not say man is born free ever since the fall of man Man is born in bondage because of original sin. Sin is what sets us in bondage. Therefore, he needs salvation in order to be free. And once again, there's these two counterpoints, this true and false freedom. 
In fact, I gave my family a little uh, trivia question uh, last night. What is the pro proclamation, what's inscribed on the Liberty Bell in P Pennsylvania? And what it is is a verse from the Torah of God, uh, which says, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. So the Torah itself could set, it's, it's, it was a document of freedom, proclaim liberty. And what that is in reference, that's Le Leviticus, and what that's talking about is something God instituted in his law, where every seven years, if you owed money, that, mo that debt was canceled. Every 50 years, if you had forfeited your God-given land because of debt, then that you were given back the land. That's called the Jubilee. And so the founding fathers put that right on the Liberty Bell. And I think that's really, really powerful and prophetic. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the whole Bible, even the old, especially the Old Testament, is a liberty document. It's a document about freedom. And there is one book that that is the whole subject of the book. And I won't uh, go through the whole book this morning because it's quite lengthy. But Exodus, Exodus is the book of freedom. Even the name, Exodus. What did we get Exodus? Well, you look at the exit, same word. We're getting out of here. We're getting out of where? Egypt. Well, what's the problem with Egypt? Bondage. What's the problem with this world? We're in bondage to sin here. The world is a house of bondage. Egypt was the typical house of bondage. In fact, the preamble to the Ten Commandments is just as important as any of the commandments. For he doesn't give any of the commandments of God in Exodus 20 until he says, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Then he gives the Ten Commandments. And, I, and I'd like to elaborate on that in just a few minutes. But notice that the freedom comes first. And then the law or the instruction. The freedom comes first. I have already set you free. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the house of Egypt. What are we celebrating at this Lord's table? It's like a mini exodus or a massive exodus, really. In Exodus, God set the children of Israel free from their slavery. In Jesus, God set the human race free from our slavery. And what was the instrument of freedom in Exodus? The blood of the Lamb. The Passover meal. And what is our freedom but the blood of Jesus? That's what set us free. Our real, our deepest bondage is sin, guilt, oppression. But Exodus is the book of freedom. And even the name itself, Exod Exodus, Exit, where you go out, you get to come out from bondage. You get to come out. Now look, the truth is every man is on an Exodus. Well, every man should be, anyway. Every man can be on an exodus. Now, some people are on a trek in deeper, but others can take the option of getting out. I want out of here. Okay, that's exodus. And let me just bring up a few points from exodus that always cross my mind, okay? In, in fact, before I bring up the points, look, this was God's purpose to liberate uh, the world, the whole world. Our God is a God of liberty. There's a beautiful verse that says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Our God sets people free. And it, to the extent that any country is, uh, acknowledges God, there's going to be liberty there. I mean, all my life I grew up, and the answer to so many arguments was, it's a free country, isn't it? <laughs> all right. Uh, the land of the free. But that freedom is based on something. That freedom is based on acknowledgement of God. God is the God of liberty. Otherwise, all there is is bondage, okay? And, and uh, uh, let me just walk through this, though, step by step. The purpose of God is to liberate the world. That's what his grand purpose is. He came to set the world free from sin, okay? But he was going to use, and, and we go back to the context of Exodus, he's going to use a liberated people. A people he created 
for his own name and for himself. That people was Israel. He was going to use a liberated people to bring the message of liberation and freedom to the whole world which is in bondage. The problem was that in Exodus chapter 1, the liberated people aren't free. They're in bondage. <laughs> they're total slaves. So he's going to raise up a deliverer to set them free so they can set the whole world free through the Messiah. But the problem was the deliverer himself was in a kind of a bondage. The children of Israel were in one kind of bondage and Moses was in another kind of bondage. So Moses had to be set free before he could set the children of Israel free, before they could set the world free. This is the logic of Exodus. And so Moses has, his freedom comes in the form of a very stark realization and a very, very terrible choice. In the book of Hebrews 11, it says, By faith Moses <laughs> forsook Egypt in his heart. Now his bondage was different. His bondage was velvet bondage. He was in the ruling class of Egypt. He somehow or other had been placed up in the royal family by God's grace, and yet he was in as much bondage in Egypt as, it, as the slaves were, just a different kind of bondage. And that's the way it is right now in the world. There are many people in just flat out bondage. Drug addicts and prostitutes and people, sin just degrades and puts you down so far that for some people, the bondage is obvious. But for a lot of people, they're in bondage, they don't even know it. They're in bondage too. Moses was in bondage, but God gave him an insight. God showed him what the real meaning of Israel was and that he was one of them. And he made this terrible choice, which was to forsake his place, his status, everything. It says he regarded uh, the reproach of the children of God. He chose that rather than the riches and power that he had in Egypt. As it says in the book of Acts 7, Moses was mighty in word and deed. He was a huge, huge figure. But he saw the slaves and he sided with the slaves. And he took his stand with them because of God. And that's how he found freedom. Now, there's a couple of things I want to say about freedom, okay, uh, from Exodus and you know, my thoughts on this subject, which it, we are in such a precipitous time because every day our so-called political freedoms are being taken away from us. Now, you can't really take freedom away from a truly free person. You can't. But there are political privileges based on the Bible and Judeo-Christian consensus that make life here very, very, very pleasant. What I've always loved about my life here is that we're free. If you see somewhere else, go somewhere else, you find out how free we really have been, okay? But that's all being lost now, and that's part of what this message is about, although you got to infer it, okay? The freedoms are being lost. Um, the first thing I want to say about true freedom, though, is this, is that you, the way God talks about freedom, and he's the liberator, is that it's always got to be seen as a gift from God himself. Moses didn't lead a rebellion or a revolution. Okay, God set them free, it's grace. And once again, I'll quote the preamble. God spoke all these words, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God did it. Now I believe to a certain extent I'm a free man too, and I can only give God the glory. God made me into a free man. Now, second thing about freedom is that we're, we learn from Exodus. And by the way, this is why tyrants hate the Bible. This is why Xi Ping in China is uh, trying to rewrite the Bible and put himself and Mao in it. One of the greatest butchers of human history is going to be the hero of the new Chinese Bible. Why do they hate the Bible? Because every time people read the Bible, they yearn to be free. Why? Because God is a God of liberty, 
and freedoms. So uh, they don't want that. The people that want to control every aspect of everybody else's life hate the Bible, okay? I just read the other day that the mob tore down at Penn U University the statue of George Whitfield. Now, George Whitfield wasn't a racist. Well, George, George Whitfield wasn't a slave owner. George Whitfield was one of the first celebrities in American history as an itinerant preacher full of the Holy Spirit, full of God, a, a friend of John Wesley's. And somehow, instinctively, the spirit that animates these mobs is now going for people like, you know, that are spiritually significant. So they tore him down. Okay, so anyway, free, no, the second point about freedom. Freedom cannot be an end in itself. Now you know this verse, okay? Let my people go. But how many you know that that's not where the verse ends? Let my people go that they may worship me. Exodus chapter 10. Let my people go that they may worship me. Now look. Uh, freedom cannot be an end in itself. Freedom to what? I remember when I was a kid, all the all this popular music was like, people everywhere just want to be free, you know. But they, they never asked the question, free to what? Free to do what? Free to be what? Now, 40 years later, I mean, they seized their liberty from... Judeo-Christian consensus from marriage, from the old views of uh, modesty and morality. They're free, okay? They're free in the very similar way to the madman of Gadara was free. The Bible says no one could bind, bind him. No one's going to tell me what to do. He would just snap the chains. You couldn't, you couldn't put him in bondage because he, he was possessed by Satan. And Satan gave him a kind of obscene freedom. How free? Well, he's free of clothes, free of people, free of conventions, free of accountability. I mean, he just kept snapping off these chains. And where do you find him in the Gospel of Mark? Among the tombs. This freedom leads to death. Uh, hate, crying every day and every night, depressed, piercing and cutting himself with stones. So what, what's your problem? You're free. You're freer than anyone else in the Bible. I mean, you don't even have to bother to wear clothes. Well, you don't want to be too free. Or you don't, to put it more accurately, you don't want to consider freedom to be the end in itself. Okay. Freedom, in God's perspective, has a purpose. Let my people go, why? That they may worship me. True freedom is the freedom to do what you were made to do or to be what God made you to be. I mean, we see the same madness today, and I'm not saying this just to be negative or just to rant on, but people want to be free of their gender assignment. This. There's a name for this, it's total autonomy. That's what false freedom is, total autonomy. You don't need God to tell you what to do. You don't need a book, certainly. You certainly don't need a preacher like Pastor Bill or the Bible to tell you what to do. You're free. And what, what people are doing in false freedom, they're just seizing this kind of freedom and they find out that a life without limits is uh, madness. The end of it is madness. I mean, even, even from the beginning, before there was a fall, even in the Garden of Eden, there, uh, one of the first gifts God gave Adam and Eve is freedom. He said, of all the trees of the garden, you may freely eat. It's the first mention of freedom in the Bible. Freely, you can have anything you want, except. He just made one boundary. There's, so there's no such thing as freedom without limits in God's economy. There's no such thing as total autonomy. Freedom is within the limits. In fact, the limits actually really set you free, even more free, okay. And you know how that story ended, okay. But, but you know, so that's how the human race came into bondage, and that's why people are born in bondage, and that's why the normal state for mankind around the world is bondage. 
One thing I think we're about ready to find out is what an anomaly America and a lot of the English-speaking democracies and republics are compared to the normal state of affairs. Okay. That's why people are trying to beat a path here. I'm not saying here is heaven, and I'm not saying here is perfect, far from it. But everywhere else is so miserable because you've got these little Satans that want to control every element of people's lives. How do you like the governor of California telling people they can't sing in church? Now, it's laughable, and it's outright laughable, but in another sense, it's quite a revelation that underneath the skin of every leftist is a dictator crying out for control. You can't sing in church? How's that gonna stop COVID? <laughs> These people are, they are the devil and the children of the devil, but don't be afraid of the children of the devil. We don't fear that. Let me go on. It can't be an end in itself. It's got to be uh, toward a, a, a purpose, a bigger agenda, the bigger than us. Let my people go that they may worship me. Now, that's the thing. If we put ourselves in bondage to God, which doesn't sound too attractive, the truth is then that sets us free. In fact, one of the greatest oppressors in your life is your own self. Okay, we're our own worst enemy, as they say, and I've found that to be true. I don't want to be run by me. I want to be under God because I found the greatest freedom there. See what I'm saying? Now, let me go to the third one, okay? The first one is, that, you know, freedom's got to be seen as a gift of grace. I am the Lord thy God, which already brought thee out of the house of bondage. By the way, notice the way he put that. He didn't say... If you will keep these Ten Commandments, I will set you free. That's not God's way. God says, I have set you free already. You are free. Bam, you're free. Free how? By the blood of the Lamb. By your God. By the Holy Spirit. I've set you free. Now, and then the second one is freedom cannot be an end in itself. Okay? Autonomy is not the goal. Now, that's, that's why our society's gone mad, is they still maintain the concept of freedom, but they, for the most part, throw out God. So basically, the only freedom that they strive for ultimately is autonomy. Look, when you want to shed your own God-given sexual role, I don't know what, the, what chains are left to break. <laughs> that's insane. Just like the madman of Gadara. And number three, now this is really important. Freedom has got to be internal. Freedom has got to be internal. Now, let, here's how I'll illustrate this. Uh, back to the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the house of bondage. That's how he starts it. And then the next thing he gives is, you shall have no other gods before you, and you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And you shall, uh, you shall not make a graven image of the Lord your God. And you should worship God at least once a week. And you should honor your father and mother. And you should not kill. Okay, now let me illustrate another way to look at this rather than just a set of do's and don'ts. What is he really saying? He's saying, look, I have done it. I have set you free by the blood of the Lamb. And that's good news, right? Now what he's saying is, then do you want to stay free? Because if you thought Pharaoh's lash was bad, that's nothing compared to having two centers in your life that you try to live for. Or just disregarding marriage and sleeping with anyone you want. That's bondage. Or just feeling free to hate people, diminish them kill them in a thousand little ways, if not the big way. Now that person is in bondage. You see, this is what the deep teaching of the Ten Commandments is, is that it's not enough to be free politically, you have to be free internally. And one of the things about the Ten Commandments, I actually love the Ten Commandments. I know a lot of Christians have chided me for that. Don't love the Ten Commandments. That's bondage. That's law. That's a set of rules. God doesn't want a bunch of rule keepers. They don't get what it is, really. 
I love the Ten Commandments because it teaches us a lot about ourselves and the way that God actually created us. I call it the law of my being. I wasn't created to have two or three gods, only one. And therefore, I'm never going to function the way I should unless I get that straight. I wasn't created to be filled with covetousness and lust for something that I don't have. It's very powerful and very, very appealing. But all you're going to be is miserable if you don't get that figured out. I wasn't created to sit there and hold a grudge and hate somebody for whatever difference we have. Now, I could do it if I want, but why do I want that? That's bondage. In other words, there's a way to look at the Ten Commandments like this. This, if you invert it and look at it in a positive sense, this is the truly free man. This is the blessed man. Like it says, blessed is the man. This is what it looks like. The really free man has one God, only one God, the true and living God. That is the only center of his life. He doesn't have two or three or four. Only one. The truly free man will not take the bait of unforgiveness and resentment. He's free. He doesn't want that. The truly free man loves his wife. He doesn't want someone else. He wants her. Or doesn't want sexual anarchy. That's bondage. That's bondage. Look, I'm going to tell you something. I really believe part of the reason the sexual revolution is promoted so heavily by the elites is because you can control people a lot easier if they're controlled already by their passions than a free, self-governed people, which is always a threat to tyrants. Aren't we thinking about tyrants on the 4th of July? Well, you can control people if you can reduce them to being creatures of lust or consumers that can't live without this and that and the other. Then you can really, the problem people always had with America is that the whole central idea was self-government that I don't need some nanny telling me whether or not to blow off a firecracker, okay? I'm a mature, grown person with freedom inside. I don't need a nanny state. But nanny states are great for tyrants. They want to control people. And I believe that the controllers are already lining up. All right. Free, and back to my original third point. Freedom has got to be internal. Now, this is crazy, but you know, a person gets a uh, car overheats and goes on the freeway and uh, takes off the cap of his radiator and it says, don't drink this, <laughs> right? Uh, you need to be told not to drink uh, antifreeze, right? Okay, so th that's a kind of a bondage. It's not giving you any credit for being an intelligent person. But, but what really puts people in bondage also is the misuse. Of, the, of their self and their being. The misuse of your sexuality, the misuse of your passions, it, it binds people, okay? Remember what Jesus said, the truth will make you free, the truth. And so it's, that's really the meaning of perversion is you twist the use of something God gave you that's valid and you, you pervert it and then the perverted are Slaves. This, this, is one of the, this is one of the other books of the Bible, is Judges, that God set them free and gave them the promised land. You can have a great, great new start. Here is land that you did not clear. Here are farms you did not build. Here are fields. I'm just giving them to you. Last people were in total bondage to sin. They were irredeemable. They were so bad, I told you, just wipe them all out. But I'm giving you a brand new, fresh, clean state, slate. And when you read uh, Judges, you're so happy at first, like, well, I can't wait to see what they do with it. And everything from then on is a cycle 
of get, just forgetting God in their prosperity, just doing whatever they wanted, worshiping any gods they wanted, and then coming under the power of a tyrant, and then being absolute slaves, and then crying out to God for deliverance. And you think, how long is this going to happen? Through the whole book. The last crisis is the worst of all. You know why? By the time they got to the Philistine crisis in the days of Samson, they just gave up crying out. You know what that means? They got used to bondage, and bondage was fine with them, I guess. I mean, as long as the Philistines let us live, let's just go along with it. That's the meaning, one of the meanings of the story of Samson. They just went with it. So the Samson caused a lot of trouble for them. They, the Jews themselves didn't like Samson. You know why? He caused trouble. They said, look, we're fine in bondage to the Philistines. We're fine. I'm afraid that's what's happening to America. People are fine doing all this stuff, going along with all this stuff. Anyway, let me go on. Uh, another lesson that we can draw about freedom from Exodus that I'm just picking and choosing here, that the whole thing is awesome, okay, is that you've got to be free from the group morality. And I'm going to quote a very important verse in my view. It's been a, one of my guiding verses of my life. And that is Exodus 23, 2. You shall not follow the multitude to do evil. Now, there's great pressure to follow the multitude. And that's why so many pastors and preachers and even some Christians, they're getting woke all of a sudden. And they're going along with the evil that's happening because they just can't resist the pressure to go along with evil. Well, they don't even want to recognize evil because then if you know it's evil, you have to take a stand, really, theoretically. But, but you know, that's why we need people like Samson that cause a little trouble here and there. Because evil is evil. It's not a relative term. It is a very, very objective thing. It's evil. You should not follow the multitude to do evil. Who is the truly, truly free man? The truly free man knows that what he has for freedom is a gift of God. The truly free man knows what freedom's for. I've been set free to worship God. I've been set free according to the laws of my being. How would you like it if someone got a, a really beautiful car and then said, you know, why do I have to put gas in it? Why, not, why can't I put maple syrup in it? Well, you just perverted the use of that carburetor. It's not, it doesn't run on that. That's what people are doing with their lives. We got something really, really beautiful. Oh, I'm not going to let that owner's manual tell me how to run it. I'm just going to do it myself. I'm free. And the really free man is internally free. In other words, even if he's in bondage, a great example of that is when Paul got put in prison and late at night he's praising God. That's the mark of a free man. He's, he's not bound by circumstances. In fact, how free was he? He was so free that when the earthquake came and opened the doors, he didn't leave. He didn't have to. He stayed right there. Why? Because he's really free. You can't buy it. The word of God cannot be bound. And you've got to be free from the group morality. Now, one of the things that is a really powerful dynamic in modern society is that people believe that if they can persuade enough people of their cause, then that'll make it righteous. Okay. Like, if you were going by that, you wouldn't think that we're righteous. We don't have that many people that we've persuaded. Try as we will. Of course, we're part of something way bigger than us, the whole universal church. I believe in one Catholic church. <laughs> I didn't say Roman. <laughs> I believe we're part of something huge and timeless. But if you judge by worldly standards, I mean, what is this? Where is everybody? Yeah, well, I don't need everybody to know what truth is. I don't need it to be verified, signified, and honored by the crowd. 
You shall not follow the multitude to do evil. Another verse is very much like that, only from a different perspective, is Proverbs. Though hand join in hand, the wicked won't go unpunished. What's he saying? I don't care how many people go along with that. You think it's going to change God's mind? What God says is wicked is wicked. Where do you see the mark of the beast, which we might see? You know how much pressure there's going to be? Probably from confessing Christians, pastors. Hey, come on. Let's grow up. Huh? You're still stuck back in the chick tracks? Come on. <laughs> it's going to be unbelievable. Final act of apostasy. And if you bow your knee or prostrate yourself on the street to a Marxist group like Black Lives Matter, I have no problem believing you just say, yeah, go ahead, do it. Let's just let's go along. This is, I'm a mature Christian. <laughs> Now, another one, that I'm not going to have you go to uh, Exodus for this, but to Galatians 5. Would you go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1? I think this is a really important concept. Um, Galatians 5, 1. Now, there's an interesting thing, thing happened in the days of the founding of this country. And I look, I've always been haunted by this because... I could recognize, even though I don't really think that everything the guy that said it was right, or he wasn't right, but it was Benjamin Franklin. He wasn't a man of God. But when he came out of the Constitutional Convention, someone says, what did you do in there? What did you make in there? He said, I've made a republic. We've made a republic if you can keep it. In other words, he recognized something. The Bible actually teaches this. The freedom's not a one-time shot. It's an ongoing calling. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This is the oldest story in the book. It's like judges. They got set free, but they ended up in bondage. Freedom, you got to see it as something that must be maintained. Like the whole book of Galatians, I mean, by modern standards, I mean, they would wonder, what's your problem, Paul, you big troublemaker? Because he went ballistic over what most people would consider a small thing. Uh, they were trying to, uh, there's certain factions in the church that were trying to bring the church in total compliance with Jewish law. and. Paul recognized right away, if they, go, if they go along with this, this will destroy the gospel. Okay, so he withstood Peter. He rebuked Peter in front of other people. Because of the principle of freedom, you've got to maintain freedom. You can't allow, now listen, don't allow anyone to put you in bondage. Okay, now I believe government has God-given functions. There are very few of them, by the way. Very few functions of government. Punish the evildoers, reward the good, get, let people live a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. When the governor of California tells Christians not to sing in church, <laughs> that's the time to get the biggest choir you can out in the parking lot and sing at the top of your lungs. Amen. Why? It's the principle. Yes. It's not rebellion. It's adherence to what Jesus told us to do. Jesus said, you shall not forsake the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is. And I'm not going to let anyone, no government or anyone, stop me. I'd rather go to jail. I'd rather die. I hope that I will be faithful to the, those words. I'd rather die than deny Christ. Okay. I'd rather die than break these principles. Paul said, look, you've got to stand fast in the liberty. Jesus Christ went to a great... Look at that table. Jesus died to set us free, to give us the ability to have a conscience, to worship God, to not be controlled by the, the, the terrible bondage of the fear of man. So I'm not going to deny that. I'm not going to just forsake that. Jesus died to set us free, so he says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. I'm not going to let people put me under... Uh, Legalistic works righteousness. I remember I was going, when I was saved, I was going to an Assembly of God church, and 
It was a great church. I love that church to this day. I'm grateful to them, okay? But they, uh, a couple months in, someone says, you want to be a member of the church? I said, I, I, thought, I thought I was. Well, we got this official membership. Oh, yeah, well, what do you got to do? They said, all you got to do is agree to these things. They gave me a piece of paper with a list. The first one says, I will not go to a movie theater. I said, nope, skip it. <laughs> Even if I didn't want to go to a movie theater, I'd still skip it. Why? Because the principle's wrong. I thought membership in the church was called being born again. Yeah, that's right. Here you go, you know, a lot of unborn again people can sign that. Yeah, I like a good strict church like this, man. It makes me feel really holy and righteous. Sure, I'll sign. You could get unborn again people to be members of a church and exclude born again people. You want that? That's why we don't have a membership of the church. You must be born again. Jesus has a membership of the church. We don't give a list of do's and don'ts. So it's the principle. You see what I'm saying? It's the principle of freedom. Now, in closing, I want to say, you know, be careful of the false freedom. Now, a lot of stuff that's going on in the world in the last hundred years and with increasing velocity, bless you, is liberation movements. Have you ever thought about it? Liberation movements. See, in, in true freedom, freedom is a gift from God. In false freedom, you have to re, re, have a revolution and seize it. And those always become like so bound by the end, they look like hell. French Revolution, hell. Lenin says, huh. Oh. People are getting killed while they're trying to set themselves free from the czars. Someone talked to Lenin about it. He said, well, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. Stalin, hey, Stalin, there's a million people you've killed. Well, when one person dies, it's a tragedy. When a million die, it's just a st statistic. Now, by the way, this is the spirit working in America right now. Leftism is evil. Just plain evil. A lot of people think I'm political. I'm not talking about Demo the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. There's enough leftists in both that I'm talking about the philosophy. It is a false religion offering a false freedom, and it's really coming to a head. You got to remember, you know, Psalm 2 warned in the last days that the kings of the earth and their rulers would have a liberation movement. They'll say, when they take their counsel against the Lord and his Christ, they'll say, let's get rid of his cords. Let's get rid of his bondage. Okay. The Supreme Court, is that they're about as elite as anyone. And they're saying, oh, we could, you got to, why should marriage be, be between a man and a woman? Just throw that out. Well, what is that? That's the cords of the Lord and his Christ. Oh, you know, abortion, I mean, person's not a person until they're out there viable. What are they throwing out? The religion of God and Christ. In the name of liberation, promising them liberty, they become slaves of corruption. No, sexual liberation never set anyone free. It's created so much misery, it's hard to fathom. Feminism only hurts women worse than anyone. This is not freedom. They don't see freedom as a gift of God. They just take it. And it's not autonomy. Freedom's not autonomy. You know, freedom doesn't mean you just go do whatever you want. Freedom is for a purpose. Let my people go that they may worship me. And that's one of the things. Every time I've been in a, you know, with a group of people praying, usually what someone says, oh, God, thank you. We live in a free country where we can worship God. And I'm thinking, right on. That's it. That's what it's all about. Freedom to be a Christian. Freedom to be who you were made to be. Freedom from tyrants. How about the biggest tyrant of all, self? How about getting set free of that tyrant? He's the worst. I think someone said to Martin Luther one time, you know the Pope's after you. He says, I'm not as much afraid of him as I'm afraid of the Pope in my heart. He's the one that's messing up my life. Tru truly free, truly free. Freedom from covetousness. Freedom from lust. Freedom from hate. There's the 
There's the free person. How does Jesus free us from hate? Well, when you realize what the cross is, that he actually came and died for our sins, how could you hold anything against anybody? How can you do it? Hate is bondage. Freedom uh, can only last as long as people acknowledge God. And I think even some of the founders said that. This Constitution was made for a virtuous people. Won't work for anybody else. It's not. It's the Constitution's breaking down. One thing to remember in closing, Constitution's not the Bible. Constitution's a brilliant, beautiful political doctrine, but it's not the Bible. Therefore, the promise does not endure to the Constitution that says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one word of my law shall pass away. That is true of the Bible. The Bible will never pass away. Constitution probably virtually for all practical purposes basically over. Bill of Rights, they're just, they're working on them. They're working on them. You can't say anything you want in public. Shoot, with the, with the uh, technology giants controlling the public discourse, half the conversation just gets censored. Who would think that? I used to think it'd be like, oh, some oppressive government, like 1984. Who knew it was gonna be the billionaires of the tech world totally controlling? But you know, one of the most oppressive countries on earth is China, but it's full of free people. There's people all over China. There are more Christians in China than there are here. They're worshiping Jesus. They, now they might pay for it with their life, we got to be willing to, to do that if that need be. I'm not looking to be a martyr, nor do I want to cause trouble. But there's one thing I would fear worse, and I don't want to deny Christ in the day of trial. Because the ultimate total freedom, Jesus said, don't be afraid of him who can hurt the body. Be afraid of him that's got the power to cast body and soul in hell. Fear him. The ultimate freedom is the freedom from what man can do to you and the fear of it. And it's only obtained through the fear of God and loving God with all our heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, breathe your breath of life on this message, on this time when we think about our freedoms of our nation and around the world, of course. Oh, bless us, Lord. Let us be worthy of the calling that you put on us. Teach us how to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Teach us, O oh Lord God, how to reach others and bring them into this glorious liberty. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you.